Well, good morning. It's uh, been really an amazing morning. Uh, congratulations to Charlie and Tabitha and the whole team on a fantastic Cognition X, uh, CogX event and everything they do at Cognition X. And uh, I'm already kind of inspired by a lot of the discussion that I've heard this morning. Now, just to start out on this topic of uh, human plus machine, uh, you saw from Catherine that uh, we've just, I've just written a book on this topic, you know, reflecting and representing the work that we do at Accenture. And uh, you know, I'm reminded of some, uh, some research I was just doing recently in the last couple of weeks. I was reading a story, this may be relevant or something you know, you've seen to some extent as well. I was reading a story about uh, an automobile that was uh, an innovative automobile that was driving down the street. And a woman walked in front of the automobile with a bicycle and was tragically injured by the accident. How many of you have heard about this incident? And how many of you think it was Uber? It, wasn't, it actually wasn't Uber. This was 122 years ago in New York City. It was the first recorded automobile accident uh, in, in, in history. Uh, it was an automobile called the Duria, and a woman walked out in front of the street with a bicycle and was, uh, was tragically in, injured by the car. Very much like the Uber accident, very similar response to the Uber incident in Arizona a few months ago. Calls for regulation. Humans shouldn't be using this technology. We needed to stop these horseless uh, carriages from running around the streets. And it's, uh, it's an illustration of the continual and cyclical uh, narrative that we have as humans with technology. I'm going to talk a lot more about that as I go through my comments today. And if you remember nothing else about what I say today, then just remember the plus sign up there in human plus machine. Because as you heard in Ariana Huffington's quote that's, uh, that's on our book, the, uh, we really do believe we're moving into an era that's about augmented and enhanced humanity, augmenting our human potential, augmenting what we do as people, and really moving from what I would describe as a dark age of information technology, where we're in essence slaves to a lot of the information technology we use now, witnessed by people holding up PCs and typing with their thumbs on these primitive little keyboards on the smartphones in your pocket, and AI really stands to transform and enhance the humanity and the way we work as people and humans. And that's what I'll talk about as I go through the talk here. And this is reflecting as well the work we do at Accenture. We're doing uh, a lot of work in AI, uh, hundreds or thousands of projects at this stage with many thousands of people. And we also did an independent research project looking at 1,500 companies in the early stages of adopting AI, and also did first-person research talking to the workers who are using this technology. And I'll share some of the findings uh, from those workers with you as well. But you know, if you look out, so you know, moving from a horseless carriage to the technology we, that we see today, uh, it's an amazing future that we're moving into. We're, we're at a, the precipice of a period of time that's unlike, uh, you know, unlike anything we've seen before. And you can see some examples in here. Uh, Sophia in the middle right, many of you have probably seen humanoid robotics, quantum computing in the center, an entirely new novel form of computing that we're already using in some projects that we're doing at Accenture. CRISPR-Cas9, uh, editing geno you know, genomics in the top, uh, the top center there. Robotics for cooking in the, uh, in the top left. And you know, microsurgery that you see in the, on the bottom row there. Tremendous technology. And what one common underpinning of all this technology is none of this would be possible, really, without artificial intelligence, either as part of the core product that you see in these images or as the enabler of the research that's driving this new innovation, which is why I call artificial intelligence the alpha trend that we all need to think about going forward. Yes, there's blockchain. Yes, there's quantum computing. Yes, there's a lot of biotech. Yes, there's virtual reality and mixed reality. But AI is really, in my, in my view and in our view, the, the alpha trend and the major trend that will shape other trends and is the big thing that we all need to pay attention to is if you're involved in uh, setting strategy, running an organization, developing an organization, or just thinking about your own career. And uh, that leads to the question of, if that's the case, if AI is the alpha trend, where are we really today? And I would say we're, we're really uh, at the early stages. You heard earlier uh, that we're maybe in the first inning of artificial intelligence using a baseball analogy. I'd say we're really in the pregame stages of artificial intelligence still. Artificial intelligence is growing out of these new, uh, new technologies you know, new, they're 60 years old, but for a lot of reasons, they're becoming more viable and relevant today. But they're the learning-based technologies, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, they're enabling us to develop systems in a very different way. 
you know, we don't have to sequentially program everything we do and test to make sure it works exactly the way we intend it to work. We can use new forms of algorithms that teach the, al that teach the software how to act based on patterns of data and such in the real world. It's the pattern recognition we heard about earlier. But that's just the start. There's a lot of other innovation coming in AI in terms of knowledge representation, symbolic reasoning, and other forms of AI that are opening up new uh, new application areas, new AI capabilities, and uh, we, we know already about computer vision, natural language understanding, and many, many other things. And that leads to these applications that we can deploy in organizations, applications like intelligent agents, uh, autonomous transportation, uh, collaborative robotics, uh, recommendation engines, et cetera. Many, many innovative applications that you really couldn't build in the same way without AI, and that's really the power of AI. But again, we're really just in the early stages of applying this. But even in its early stages, uh, I've been working in, in the uh, enterprise technology arena, information technology and related fields for 35 years now, and been through all the trends and led our business through many of the trends that have happened over that period of time. And we've never seen a technology impact business as fast as artificial intelligence. We've never seen a business in Accenture grow as fast as our artificial intelligence business. That includes desktop computing, the internet, cloud computing, mobile, IoT, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing's moving as fast as artificial intelligence is moving today. And again, we're just getting started with this, and it's why it's so important for all of, all of us and all of you to understand as you think about your organizations. And uh, you know, just to bring it to life uh, in a short period of time here, I'll talk about three myths, three imperatives, and three challenges that we see with artificial intelligence. And these are what we write about in our book, and you can go to our Accenture booth that we have here too and hear more about this. But I'll just uh, describe this to you, because I think this will give you a flavor for our perspective on AI and, and, uh, and what's happening. First of all, with the three myths, this has come up a little bit already today, so I won't dwell on it too long. The first myth is that the robots are coming for us. This is the superintelligence transhumanism narrative. And we, don't, we believe this isn't something you need to worry about for the next couple of human generations, at least. So this isn't the issue for today. And it's getting in the way of people doing a lot of things that are very important in organizations. So it's important to cast this aside as a myth, at least for now, in the context of, your, of our planning horizons and the work you're thinking about doing. And uh, it's the 50th anniversary of 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's Hal in the top right. Uh, it's the 30th, 35th anniversary of Joshua. Who knows Joshua? Okay, a couple of people. War Games, the movie War Games, 35 years ago last week, was Joshua, the AI that was going to take over the nuclear control systems and destroy the world. So robots aren't coming for us. The second myth, we believe, is that the machines will take all of our jobs. You heard from Moya a minute ago at Royal Mail. I agree with what she said. It's easy to, to uh, predict the jobs that will be improved or more productive and where, where, you'll, where we'll lose jobs in the economy. We will lose millions of jobs as a result of continual automation, but that's not new. That's, in essence, the definition of technology, making it easier for humans to do things. So we shouldn't be surprised that we're going to lose some jobs as a result of that. And it's going to be a significant number of jobs, probably on the order of 15% of jobs that will be automated. And, and, but there will be new jobs created, and it takes imagination to see the new jobs. And I think you heard Moya talking about that. It's firmly our belief as well. So the issue is really preparing people for the different sorts of jobs that will be there. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the third myth is that you can keep doing things the same way you've been doing them in the past, and we don't believe this is true, and you need to take a different approach. So those are the myths. Then if you get into the imperatives, the first one I'll pick up on is what do you need to do differently? We believe, again, this is about imagination and reimagining the way you do business. So we talk about a third generation of work, a third generation of business process that we're in the midst of right now. It's not about automating or reengineering. It's about reimagining the, the way you do your business. It's dynamic, personalized, adaptive work processes. You can't model these in flowcharts and Visio like, you've, like we've been doing in, in business in the past. It's the work will change continuously based on the worker's capability and based on the needs of the equipment or the business process they're managing. Things like digital twin models in, um, in, uh, in the industrial equipment arena. Things like stitch fix, new retail models, creating new types of roles and a new, new, whole new business models in the retail industry. That's really the future with AI, reimagining the business. The second imperative is to reimagine work in the way you think about work. And uh, reimagining work is about thinking about jobs in different ways. And we talk about this extensively in the book. We believe there's six categories of new jobs that organizations are not focusing on today. 
six categories of new jobs that will employ millions of people in the new, econ in, in the new AI economy that we're moving into. On the left-hand side of what you see, these are jobs where people are needed to help manage AI or, or develop AI, not engineer and program the AI, not machine learning experts, but other business people that need to be involved in the business as you deploy AI. On the right, we're talking about how we can enhance existing jobs with AI and in essence give people superpowers to perform more, more productively and more effectively with AI in a number of categories you see there. Things like uh, new design capabilities powered by generative design tools you know, enabled by AI, those types of capabilities are what we see giving people these superpowers. And finally, the third imperative is about responsible AI, which we've, you've heard a bit, little bit about this week. But this is moving beyond Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics, which some of you may have heard about if you're science fiction fans. Those didn't adequately address the risks of AI and what we need to think about in organizations. So we've developed you know, five principles that we believe are the important things you need to manage to make sure you're deploying AI in an organization in a safe way, in an inclusive way, in a non-biased way, in an honest way. Uh, in an explainable and understandable way. This is an important thing. If you're deploying AI and you don't have these things sorted out, you're, you're at risk of getting yourself, your, your workers, your consumers, and your community into trouble. So these are big things uh, that we believe are important. And we believe things like chief AI officers in organizations are important to think about uh, as you think about how you embed this into your organization. And I'll wrap up here on three challenges that are important. The first one that I've already hinted at is that the big issue isn't the jobs and the availability of jobs. The big issue is how do we make sure that the benefits of the technology are, are uh, deployed inclusively to people and that we're reducing, you know, or we're increasing the access to, to jobs and skills. And as people are, as people's roles are automated in certain professions, how do they get retooled for new jobs? So one commitment we've made as part of the book is to donate all the proceeds of the book, not to me or my co-author or Accenture, we're donating all the proceeds to nonprofits who are focused on mid-career reskilling in particular, because we think people in the middle of their careers are the ones who have the least support currently and where there's the least amount of innovation uh, in terms of thinking about how do we continuously reskill people who will be impacted by the technology. And then data I've already talked about. And the third challenge is there's no finish line for this. If you think you understand AI today, that's not enough uh, because AI is you know, changing and evolving itself very rapidly. So you need to develop an innovation capability in your organization. So uh, the way I'd wrap it up is just by saying you know, it's time to reimagine now, like re really rethink your own career, the way you do things in your organization, and the way your business works, which is the approach we're taking with, uh, in extension with what we call applied intelligence and applying this to business. And if you want to see more, you can uh, buy the book. All the proceeds, again, go to charity. They don't go to me or Accenture. It's about, you know, it's about our commitment to looking at the deployment of AI in a safe, effective, responsible, and inclusive way and making sure that we, we bring everybody along that needs to come along to benefit from the age of AI that we're moving into. So thank you. With that, uh, Catherine. I think we're going to sit down over here. So sit down, OK. Thanks, Paul. That was, that was fantastic. I have um, some questions for you. I would imagine um, so. And I know that we've been chatting a little bit. And you told me that um, your first job, confession time here, was, uh, well, first it was mowing lawns, but your actual first job was uh, as a coder. And that was 32 years ago, and that was at Accenture. So that you, you have been relearning, reimagining your entire kind of career over the past 32 years in technology. And I'm fascinated, you talked about skills. What is it? How did you relearn? How did you reimagine your skills? And is there anything that you ever learned which transformed the way that you think or the way that you work or the way that you learn? Yeah, no, I've, uh, yeah, I've been with Accenture 32 years and I, I joined for one year and was good at joining, bad at quitting, so I'm still here 32 years later. But the, uh, and I started out coding, and I thought there was nothing else I'd ever want to do in life other than code, and I still code today just because I think it's a wonderful, there's nothing like coding where you can have artistic expression, and creative expression, as well as you know, make things really happen, so I, I still love to code. But uh, the important thing for me has been just continually learning along the way. The, the, the technology we're using now bears little resemblance to the technology of the past, so it's about how do you, continually learn. So for myself, it's about you know, my own personal learning platform. And then as I've, uh, you know, as I've moved on through Accenture, it's, it's helping create those learning platforms and, and teaching platforms 
for others as well. So I spent a lot of my time teaching and teaching you know, people in the organization about different things, whether it be technology or innovation or different uh, elements of what we need to do to be successful. So I think for every individual, it's about what's your own learning platform to innovate and develop your own skills because the only thing that's certain is, is the change is gonna accelerate and the pace of change is gonna accelerate. What you know now isn't gonna be sufficient to keep you employed or successful three or four or five years from now. I thought it was fascinating that you said that you, in that entire history of your career, you've never seen a technology impact business as fast as AI. And that this was, you called it the alpha. Alpha trend, yeah. Alpha trend, I love, I love that. And, um, but are you seeing business move as fast as that impact? And what are the biggest barriers for businesses implementing these technologies? That's a great question. I think we have a technology surplus. If you stopped innovation today, there's a, there's a massive technology surplus out there already for organizations to take advantage of. We have a, a technology surplus and an innovation surplus. We have an adoption. Uh, deficit, adoption shortfall, and businesses cannot adopt, you know, cannot, uh, you know, uh, invest and change fast enough to adopt the new technology that exists today even to change their business, and that challenge is going to increase. The solution to that, I think, is three things. You have to, and it really all comes down to people, which is counterintuitive. You don't need to invest in the technology, you need to invest in the people, and the first investment is around culture. If, if, if you're not developing an innovation culture, you need to. It's more about experimentation and innovation. We heard some of this in panels earlier today about innovation culture in Europe, and that's mandatory, and it comes from the top as well as the grassroots culture of innovation. The second thing is investing in people who are developing this new technology. So you do need technologists. How are you going to de you know, develop in your organization some world-class AI experts who are going to you know, you know, figure out how to apply this to your business and make sure you have them available to you. And then the third thing is how do you invest in people who are doing your business, who, are, who aren't developing AI but are using AI, and investing in those people, as, we, as I said, with the reskilling is the other key thing. So I think investing in people, you know, somewhat paradoxically, I think is the key to really leading with technology as we go forward. We're getting into the human bit here. The human. And uh, you talked about the myths, um, but the fear is real. Uh, you know, it's very, very human. And um, how do we not just tell people not to be afraid that their jobs are going to get replaced by machines? How, what, what other ways can we show them? I think, yeah, I think I mean, there's, it's, it's a, we just have to recognize, first of all, this is a human thing. When fire was invented or the wheel, people, people were afraid of any technology. But at the same time, we, we love the technology because it improves, and improves the way we live and work as humans. So it's been the case with every technology. I think the, the thing we need to do is do a better job at conveying to people what this is really about. I mean, the Hollywood stereotypes don't help because it's all about AI taking over the world. Why don't we talk about how AI is making, you know, making better produce available in food deserts, eliminating uh, you know, waste, wasteful food supply chains because AI allows us to grow in urban, you know, dense urban centers in new innovative ways or talk about how it's treating patients with depression and autism more effectively and creating new professions in the healthcare industry using AI-enabled you know, treatment uh, options. I think we need to do a much better job of publicizing and sharing that and also then demonstrating our commitment to people that we're going to help them learn and provide the right platforms for them to advance as they go forward. Amazing. Thank you very much, Paul. I love that. Hollywood, you're not helping. <laughs> so human and machine the movie, please. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you. Bye -bye.